Epic Game Store exclusivity is a practice which bothers me quite a lot. I know, I know, I've never said anything about it before, but it's true, I hate the Epic Store and the practice of exclusivity sniping. While the feature set of the store has improved over the last year, it still hasn't instituted basic things like an achievement system or universal controller support. As such, I've decided to abstain from playing any game which takes the Epic exclusivity deal until they launch on other PC storefronts. I'm waiting you out, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. For the most part, this hasn't worked out too badly for me as I lucked out on Metro Exodus having its Steam pre-orders honored, The Outer Worlds launched on PC Xbox Game Pass in addition to Epic, and I personally couldn't care less about Borderlands 3. But one game hurt because I thought it looked really cool. That game was Remedy Entertainment's Control. Control's announcement trailer looked really cool, with the seemingly living building surreal architecture looking like it was breathing, and flashy third-person shooter combat that looked like Remedy's Quantum Break had a baby with the Force Unleashed. And yet, time moves forward, a year passes, and before you know it, a game which you waited to play is available on a better platform with all its DLC for half the price the vanilla version launched at. Good things come to those who wait. Or if you're on console, apparently fuck you for not waiting, but more on that later. When I finally got to fire up my Steam version of Control Ultimate Edition, I was immediately struck by how cool the tone and atmosphere were. The first two Max Payne games and Alan Wake were soaking with style, but Quantum Break had a very mainstream, sci-fi original series vibe to it, so it may have seemed to some that Remedy had lost their edge, but Control is arguably their most stylistic and atmospheric game to date. You, as the game's ginger heroine, Jesse Faden, enter a building called The Oldest House, which is the headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Control, in search of your missing brother. The building appears to be completely empty until you arrive at the office of the Bureau Director to find him dead on the floor, the victim of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Jesse picks up the gun and realizes that it appears to be a living being. From there, Jesse finds herself making trips to a place called the Astral Plane, which looks shockingly similar to the Astral Plane in Platinum Games' Astral Chain, in order to unlock superpowers to help her unravel the mysteries of the oldest house and stop the phenomenon known as the Hiss, which has been corrupting the employees of the Bureau, effectively turning them into crazed, superpowered zombies. If all that sounds overwhelming, it kind of is, as I've now spent about 25 hours in control and I still don't think I'd be able to explain the story with an acceptable degree of accuracy. The storytelling is intentionally obtuse and the concepts are intentionally abstract, as this game really wants you to dig into the numerous pieces of lore scattered around the oldest house. Luckily, doing so is quite rewarding, as you eventually start forming a concept of what altered items do, what altered world events are, and just what the oldest house actually is. The short answer is that The Oldest House is sort of the nexus of Remedy's cinematic universe, or maybe multiverse, and is being used as a base of operations for the Bureau to study supernatural phenomena, such as the Hiss or the Dark Presence from Alan Wake. The Oldest House is special because while it is a physical building, it seems to operate on rules similar to those that a dream plays by. If the oldest house is a dreamscape, those corrupted by the hiss are trapped in a nightmare, the humans wearing the speaker-like HRA devices are having a weird dream, and the new director, Jesse, is a lucid dreamer. And in a dreamscape, a lucid dreamer is basically a superhero, baby. The combat and control is for the most part totally awesome. The enemy AI won't be winning any awards as they are very easily tricked by corners, but the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the gameplay is top tier. It is very fast paced and involves having to be on the move almost constantly as there is no cover mechanic, but this is a good thing because if Quantum Break should have taught Remedy one lesson, it's that stop and pop shooters aren't really their area of expertise. They are, however, incredible at making a run and gun shooter. There's technically only one gun in control, Jesse's service weapon, but it has many forms which effectively turn it into all of the staple third person shooter weapons. There is a pistol form, a shotgun form, a fairly useless submachine gun form, a very powerful charge shot sniper form, a triple shot rocket launcher form, and in the DLC, a remote detonated sticky grenade launcher form. Some of these are quite a lot more useful than others, with the submachine gun or spin form being the notably useless standout. The grip form, your pistol, is a decent workhorse if you can reliably land headshots, and the shatter form, your shotgun, is quite useful early on or for dealing with the dudes who rush at you and then explode, which is everyone's favorite enemy type in a shooter. The pierce, charge, and surge are the big boys, and especially late in the game, they'll be the ones you want to be using to deal gun damage, as they require skill to use, but they hit hard. Whichever form you're in, the service weapon feels great to use, and while the reload system is a bit strange, it serves the gameplay well once you grow accustomed to it. 
All forms share the same ammo pool, taking more or less of it depending on the strength of the ordnance you're firing, and there's no reload button, the service weapon just naturally recharges when you stop firing for a few moments. During this recharge time, Jessie is far from defenseless though, because she's also a more powerful Jedi than Rey Palpatine could ever hope to be. Unlike Rey, Jessie does have to work to unlock these abilities, but somewhat like Rey, you get telekinesis very early on. But I wasn't complaining about that because the launch ability and control is flat out awesome. Similar to the Force Unleash, you can target objects in the background, pick them up, and then throw them at enemies. If you pick up an object behind an enemy, you will do damage to that enemy as the object flies toward Jesse, followed by heavy damage when you then throw the object directly into their face. The other abilities aren't quite as useful as launch, but all of them serve to spice up the combat. The melee attack is technically a superpower, but I personally didn't use it very much outside of the opening missions. You can unlock an evade dash and a levitation ability, which you can use in tandem. When you unlock both of these, it really opens up the movement mechanics. When you combine the evade, levitation, and the relatively quick run speed, it gives you a lot of options for dodging enemy attacks, and as previously mentioned, it avoids the need for Remedy to implement any kind of cover system. I hate to rag on Quantum Break too much, but the press to cover system in that game is loose and wonky, to the point that I didn't even want to put in the time to make a video on it like I did for Alan Wake. But it is on Game Pass, so give it a shot if you want to see Iceman fighting Littlefinger, or if you just want to see more of Courtney Hope, who's the actress who plays Jessie in this game. Sorry for the tangent, my point was that the mobility and control serves a Remedy Shooter's defensive gameplay much better than Quantum Break's cover system ever did. Your other defensive option is the ability to pick up a bunch of debris to create a shield. This is useful in a pinch, but evasion seemed to be the much more useful option to me. The final ability you have is a good old fashioned Jedi mind trick. You will remove these restraints and leave this cell with the door open. No. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Whew, yeah, that's the stuff. You know how to do it, Obi-Wan. This lets you charm an enemy to fight on your side, which can even the odds a bit, particularly when you're fighting some of the more powerful enemy types, as even if your charmed enemy doesn't do crazy amounts of damage, it will pull aggro from the stronger enemies and give you a bit of breathing room. Your superpowers are all mediated by an energy bar, which like the service weapon ammo, recharges over time. This creates a great rhythm where you launch some debris at a group of enemies, light them up with your gun, levitate into the air, then ground slam them and continue to light them up with a different form of the gun. Constantly switching back and forth between your superpowers and your guns means the gameplay doesn't get stale because you constantly have to vary your tactics. You can't just cheese one attack and win. Or, I mean, you can, you just kind of have to trick the enemy AI with the aforementioned corners and still wait for one or the other to recharge. Which, don't get me wrong, I guess is effective if you're stuck in an area and just want to cheese your way through it, but it's really not very much fun and it does make the gameplay feel quite dull. The vast majority of Control's gameplay involves this combat loop, and while there are a fair amount of enemy types with a few curveballs here and there, all of the fights have a pretty similar feel to them. Luckily, it all feels very good, largely due to the incredible audiovisual presentation. Similar to the satisfying pops of the darkness shields in Alan Wake, the sound of Jesse's telekinesis makes it feel like tearing something off the wall and readying it to be thrown is a real superhero feat. Not only that, Control might have one of the best environmental destruction systems this side of a Battlefield game. Only the ginger female superhero in this game actually makes some sense. <laughs> Friend. You might walk into a pristine office space, but once some enemies spawn, the bullets start flying and Jesse starts ripping chunks of concrete off the wall and chucking them through a desk to hit an enemy on the other side of it, it quickly turns into an explosive symphony of paper and dust. It's pretty sick. For my playthrough, I had the game running at 1440p at high settings with ray tracing set to medium and DLSS on, and was getting around 65 to 80 frames a second in combat so this game definitely has some room to advance over the years. It will certainly act as a nice benchmark game for the 3000 series graphics cards, and I can only imagine what it'll look like on a high-end PC in 5 or even 10 years from now. However, outside of the visual effects in combat and the incredible art design, there are a few nits to pick about the visuals. While Courtney Hope's face has been beautifully rendered, the facial animations aren't what I'd call industry best. In fact, with the rest of the game looking as impressive as it does, the story segments are hit pretty hard by how wooden and expressionless most of the characters are. It doesn't help that most of the dialogue segments are sterile exposition dumps, but ultimately the world is so interesting and the story is so trippy that I found myself pretty invested. 
The solid performances from Jesse, the mysterious janitor Ati, and the two characters portrayed by Matthew Peretta, Dr. Darling, and a certain Alan Wake do a fair amount to help sell the world. Aside from the story and learning more about the world, the main driving force behind the gameplay will be your own pursuit of power. Unlocking superpowers will open up new areas of the oldest house, as the game follows a similar format to Batman Arkham Asylum, and completing quests will unlock ability points. While you can get through the main campaign without even unlocking all the powers, you can put in a little bit of extra elbow grease and make several of the powers you do have far more useful than they are at base level. Most of the side quests don't take very long and will reward you with one or even several ability points. Not only that, many of the side quests have incredible content attached to them, including a few of the best boss fights in the game. It might sound a bit weird to say, dude, you really need to fight the fridge in this game, but that fridge is evil and it needs to pay. There are also a few pretty cool puzzles to solve, like one in which you go into a mirror universe where everyone is speaking backwards. Christopher Nolan isn't the only one doing backwards stuff. Huh? Tennis? Check out my review on Geeks and Gamers. When you do get your extra points, you can put them into whichever ability suits your playstyle, but I strongly recommend maxing out Launch because it's the best power in the game. But also be sure to get the Shield Bash and Ground Pound because, well, they're just fun. The other means by which you can increase your power is the mod system. You can equip 1-3 to three mods on Jesse and 1-3 to three mods on each weapon form, and all of them give buffs to things like health regen, headshot damage, rate of fire, all your standard gear type power-ups. The problem is that your inventory space is very limited and you're finding mods constantly, so you'll find yourself spending a lot of time during this game deconstructing mods. This is a bit of a shame because there is a system of challenge levels called Expeditions in which you use jukebox tokens to set a series of four challenges in a boss fight with a random modifier such as reduced weapon damage, then complete it within a 25 minute time limit in exchange for a few high powered mods. If you had the option to farm and collect mods indefinitely, the Expeditions could have provided infinitely replayable endgame content, but because of how many mods you end up destroying, it's hard to keep a collection large enough to see how valuable a level 2 Expedition mod actually is. What you'll likely end up doing is assigning a few powerful mods to buff health recovery or energy capacity, a damage or ammo buff to each weapon, and then call it a day. You can tell that there were definitely people at Remedy who were hoping that you'd be very invested in the mod system and want to min-max your character, but it's, it's just really not that necessary. The health, checkpoint, and death systems in Control are a bit of a mixed bag as well. Health is handled in a pretty cool way. There's no automatic health regeneration, but doing damage to enemies will make them drop small health power-ups. You don't have to kill an enemy, just damage them and get close enough to pick up the power-ups, which works well to encourage aggression in combat. If you do die, you end up at the last control point you use, which is kind of similar to how the bonfires work in the Dark Souls games, but it feels a bit misplaced here. Some of the control points are very far apart, and when you respawn at one which requires a 3 minute trek to get back to the battle you were just fighting in, it feels less like a steep penalty for death and more like an unnecessary inconvenience. When you die, you lose 10% of an in-game currency called Source, which can be used to upgrade your service weapon forms, forge jukebox tokens for the expeditions, or craft randomly generated mods. You stumble across more than enough jukebox tokens and mods, so you'll likely just be using Source to upgrade your weapons, but those upgrades also involve finding other materials in various treasure chests scattered around the oldest house. I never lacked for anything but Source when it came time to upgrade, but that's also because it wasn't until about three quarters through the main campaign when I realized weapon upgrading or even Source were a thing. It's not communicated very clearly, but as a death penalty it worked well enough. It put some sting into dying when I was close to affording that next upgrade, but it also didn't make me want to pull a Ryan Kennel on my input device. God! <laughs> Fucking boomerang! God damn it! The main campaign of Control is fairly short, to the point that I was actually pretty shocked when I was seeing credits. Though the first set of credits turned out to be a fake out, but the real ending wasn't more than an hour beyond them. Pursuing the aforementioned side quests adds a lot of content to the game, and the Ultimate Edition contains both DLC expansions, which are rather significant. The Foundation expansion takes you into a network of aesthetically distinct caves beneath the oldest house, and adds two new puzzle solving options, which involve summoning or destroying stalactites and stalagmites. During a quest in the Astral Plane, you choose which one to unlock first, and that choice will affect some of your combat options. It doesn't dramatically change the game in any major way, but the new abilities did add a bit of variety to the formula. The second expansion is the AWE expansion. AWE is the acronym for Altered World Events in the Federal Bureau of Control, but it can also be read as Alan Wake expansion or experience, as this is the Alan Wake crossover DLC. 
Matthew Peretta does reprise his role of Alan Wake in a few scenes, but it is primarily a new control questline where you hunt down a twisted mutation of Dr. Hartman, the psychologist from Alan Wake. Hartman has been turned into a grotesque monster by the Dark Presence and the Hiss, and has begun to terrorize the oldest house. There are a lot of puzzles which involve manipulating light, but sadly they never go as far as having the Taken overrun the oldest house and giving Jesse a flashlight. There are some situations in which you use telekinesis to pick up a work lamp and then use it to burn away darkness corruption, but it's definitely control with a dash of Alan Wake rather than the full-blown crossover event that many were expecting. That being said, it's loaded to the brim with Alan Wake Easter eggs. Do you have a flashlight? No. Uh, a lantern? Headlamp? Boy, a flare gun. Oh, Christmas lights. You could wrap them around your- I don't have any of those, Langston. And the ending sets up the long-desired Alan Wake 2 in a pretty explicit way. Now the big question, should you buy Control Ultimate Edition? If you're like me, are on PC and abstain from picking up the Epic Game Store version, absolutely yes, this game rocks and you should play it. However, if you own Control on PS4 or Xbox One and were looking forward to playing it on the next-gen consoles due to the piss-poor performance on the original platforms, then that's a much stronger maybe, which will probably depend on your personal values. If money isn't really a concern and you just want to see this game with ray tracing enabled on a console running at an acceptable frame rate and are okay with giving Remedy and the publisher 505 games another 40 bucks, then yes, absolutely, go for it. However, if you bought the base game for $60, the season pass for $20, and think that 505 is being ridiculous for asking you to pay an additional $40 to play a game you already own on better hardware, you're right, that is ridiculous and you probably shouldn't pay it. Being the Geeks and Gamers PC preacher, that being my stance should be obvious. I can't imagine a world where I have to buy all of my games again when I upgrade my video card. 505 has been taking a lot of heat for forcing console players to double dip, so personally I hope that they'll cave, take a page from CD Projekt's playbook, and just upgrade their early adopters for free. And I'd love to say that either way, Remedy isn't to blame, but they did take the Epic exclusivity deal last year, so their hands might not be squeaky clean in all this. Taking the shady business stuff out of the equation, Remedy is a great studio who have been through a lot, and they seem to be hitting a stride, so if you do decide to support them and play their game, I think you'll be happy you did but I can't give them a free pass on what are clearly anti-consumer business practices at the same time. So if you do want to take a stand, but still want to play Control again on the next-gen consoles, wait for a deep sale or pick up a used copy if that's an option on the next-gen hardware you decide to buy. If you are a new player, either because you missed it last year on PS4 or Xbox One, or you're like me and you don't want to give Epic a single red cent of your money beyond licensing fees they receive from Unreal Engine games, then Control is an incredibly stylish, well-made superhero shooter, which really starts bringing the pieces of the Remedy universe together. So pick up your service weapon, channel your inner off-brand Jedi, and enter the oldest house.